What we've seen today was an act of violence. A massive stolen 18-wheeler speeding right into a state office building full of people. And tonight, we've got answers as to why the driver might have targeted that building. Hey, I'm Gotti Schwartz, and this is Stay Tuned Now. In Texas tonight, a fully loaded 18-wheeler used as a weapon in a deadly attack on a Department of Public Safety office by a man police say had just been turned down for a commercial's driver's license in that same office yesterday. Now, this is the aftermath of that attack that's turned tragic. Police say at least one person has been killed and several others were hurt after that truck came crashing through the front of the Department of Public Safety office. It happened in the town of Brenham, Texas, about 75 miles west of Houston. Houston. A video of this scene shows the extent of the damage, that gaping hole in the entrance there. Police identified the suspect as a 42-year-old man who had just visited the DPS office yesterday and was denied a commercial driver's license. That's the license you need in order to legally drive large trucks like 18-wheelers or buses. A dispatch calls paint the picture of the moment that stolen truck went crashing into the building. Crashing into the DPS, bro. I see him crashing into the DPS. DPS. Roll everything to DPS. Stolen vehicle that crashed into the DPS office, an 18-wheeler versus the DPS office. There is entrapment in the building. As far as that, it is a building that sure is not going to start getting people out through these windows. Some terrifying moments there. NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson is joining us now from Brenham, Texas. Priscilla, a lot of victims in this attack. Do we know how the survivors are doing right now? Yeah, there were more than a dozen people who were injured, a number of them treated on the scene, but six people were rushed to the hospital, and one of those people has died. There are two others that are in critical condition tonight fighting for their lives, and what's more, the mayor says that this could have potentially been much worse. Take a listen to what he said earlier. The uh, suspect was backing the vehicle up and with the intent of going into it again, our fire chief mentioned that if he had veered a little bit to the left the second time, there would have been a collapse of that building. And with more than a dozen people injured, just based off of what happened here today, you can imagine how devastating it would have been if he had been able to take make a second attempt at this building and potentially allowing the whole thing to collapse. Gotti. Uh, Priscilla, how do they stop him? I mean, you see the truck right there. You see the hole that they, he, the damage he already called, uh, caused. But uh, how did all of that come to an end? Yeah, so the thing here, the interesting thing here is that this truck belonged to somebody else. They had left it running, according to the dispatch audio, whenever this suspect, uh, Leonard, Leonard Parker, got into the truck and took off. And that's when that original driver called police, reported the truck stolen. And so there were already officers behind the truck whenever he turned into uh, this parking lot and crashed it into uh, the building. And so officers were able to act very quickly to apprehend him after that happened and of course we are learning from police that he had come in just yesterday to get that commercials driver's license and that renewal was denied police saying that this was an intentional act tied to that and of course now the suspect is in custody facing multiple felony charges Gotti. priscilla thompson thanks so much uh, for that report i mean it, think, thankfully the police were there and were able to stop that truck from going back in Meanwhile, in Memphis, one police officer was killed and another two were hurt after an early morning shootout with two teenage suspects. And one of the teenagers was also killed. All of this after officers reportedly responded to a call about a suspicious car at 2 a.m. Here's what the mayor said earlier today. Uh, we need a community call to action. Um, we are heartbroken uh, of the lives lost. Um, our fallen officer, um, and, and this senseless act of violence. Um, we know that we as a community have to do more uh, to hold violent offenders accountable for their actions. Uh, even our young people, we have to make sure that we are pressing for accountability. For more, let's go to NBC News correspondent Priya Shrether. 
Gotti, I'm here in Memphis, Tennessee, where an early morning shootout has left one Memphis police officer and an 18-year-old suspect dead. Police say they responded to a call about a suspicious vehicle shortly after 2 o'clock this morning. When police arrived at that vehicle, they say the two people inside of that car opened fire. They say that's when police officers fired back, and the two suspects attempted to escape from the police officers in the car. Those officers were able to catch up with the suspects, but in the barrage of bullets, three police officers officers were shot and the two suspects were aged 17 and 18 years old. Those two suspects, along with two of the shot police officers, were rushed to the hospital where tragically Joseph McKinney, who had joined the Memphis Police Department back in 2020, was pronounced dead along with the 18-year-old driver of that vehicle. Now, Memphis police said that they had actually encountered that 18-year-old suspect just a few weeks ago when he was arrested in the possession of a stolen vehicle and a semi-automatic weapon that had been illegally modified. Today, the district attorney of Shelby County released a statement shortly after the shootout saying that this individual had already been identified as a high priority offender and that his bond should have never been lowered so that he was back out on the streets of Memphis. Gotti. Priya, thank you. And a family of a 15-year-old boy who was shot by police in Akron, Ohio, is demanding a full investigation and accountability into these moments captured on a police body cam and a warning. Some might find these images disturbing. The video, parts of which police have blurred, shows how the officer pulled alongside Tavion Kuntz Williams, opened the car door, and asked to see his hands after responding to a call about someone pointing a gun at houses. That's when the officer fired a single shot, hitting Tavion in the hand and wrist. Police say he had, quote, a facsimile firearm, which basically means a gun replica. His family and their lawyers say, yes, Tavion was carrying a toy gun at the time and tried telling the officer it was fake. Ryan Westlake is the officer who shot Tavion. He's been put on paid administrative leave. And NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster joins us now with more. Shaq, a lot of what we know is because of that video and what the officer right. is heard saying in that video and what Tavion is heard saying in that video right before and right after the shots were fired fired, right? What's the family yeah. now saying that video shows? Well, the family is essentially saying that there was nothing more that Tavion could have done, that he made clear to the officer that it was a fake gun and that the instance and incident happened so quickly that there was not anything different that could have taken place. I want to play a little bit more of that body camera video and listen to exactly what you hear Tavion and the officer say. Can I see your hands real quick? Shots fired, shots fired. It's fake, it's fake, it's fake, it's fake, it's fake. Shots fired. Drop to the ground, drop to the ground. Drop to the ground. Drop to the ground. Drop to the ground. It's fake, it's fake. I promise. Hands be on your back. Now, the family said in the press conference, while Tavion will have a full recovery, we did see some bandaging on his right arm, and they say that he's still struggling to sleep and that he's going to be dealing with trauma and that it's taken over his entire life. I want you to listen to a little bit more of what we heard directly from his family. It is not okay, and we are sick and tired of watching our babies die in the hands of people who swore an oath to protect and serve, it has to stop. Because then it won't just be my child, it'll be yours next. The belief of the family is that this is more than any one incident, but it's a culture in policing, and that's what they want to address. Hey Jack, the video has now been out for, for a little bit of time. What are cops saying the video shows? Well, the city and the police department, they're not specifically addressing it other than the mayor saying that this is a tragedy uh, and that they will continue to do an investigation. But you have the Fraternal Order of Police, uh, essentially the police union, saying that what they did and what they saw uh, in their officer was justified. In a statement that just came out after the press conference just about an hour or so ago, they say that we continue to support our brother. And they go on to say the officer's personnel file has nothing to do with this incident. 
However, that's what's being talked about. And what they're referencing there is when you look back at the personnel file that the city released as they released this body camera video, they showed that the officer has had other use of force incidents, including one that was deemed unreasonable. In addition to that, he's been suspended before, he's been fired uh, before, and then was reinstated after apparently a deal between the police union and the city. That is something that you heard the family bring up, but you hear the police union saying that uh, this officer acted in accordance with policy and that his actions were justified, Gotti. And check this shooting adds to a pretty controversial list of police shootings in Ohio. The 2014 killing yeah. of Tamir Rice in Cleveland, the 2022 killing of uh, or shooting of Jalen Walker also in Akron there. What is the response right now from the community? Yeah, you have a lot of outrage. You have one uh, at that press conference we saw a community member say that it was just a couple of years ago, just two years ago, when Jalen Walker, who was a man who was shot about 40 times by Akron police in a hail of about 90 bullets, uh, they were calling then, uh, they, back then I should say, they were calling for a, the Department of Justice to step in with a pattern and practice investigation. That is not something they got. And you had a member of the community saying, sorry, I thought we made more progress on this uh, issue, and that apparently is not the case. So you have those calls now being reviewed for, again, the federal government to come in and investigate the entire police department. The family is also calling for the firing of that officer, and they want a complete investigation of this shooting, which, by the way, Ohio law requires. This is being investigated by an independent state agency, and then those findings will be presented to a grand jury for possible charges, Gotti. Looking forward to those findings. NBC News correspondent Shaq Brewster, thank you so much for joining us. And Vice President Kamala Harris was in Arizona today campaigning there after that controversial state Supreme Court ruling on abortion. And she blasted former President Donald Trump over his role in overturning Roe v. Wade. During his campaign in 2016, Donald Trump said women should be punished for seeking an abortion. Don't forget that. And now, because of Donald Trump, more than 20 states in our nation have bans. Earlier this week, President Joe Biden warned that Trump would sign a federal abortion ban if elected again. Today, Trump said that's not true because, in his words, it's no longer necessary. We don't need it any longer because we broke Roe v. Wade and we did something that nobody thought was possible. We gave it back to the states, and the states are working very brilliantly, in some cases conservative, in some cases not conservative, but they're working, and it's uh, working the way it's supposed to. So with Arizona being the latest ground zero for the abortion fight right now, how do Arizonan voters feel? Well, our NBC News exit polls found 62% of Arizona respondents believe that abortion should be illegal. NBC News correspondent Dana Griffin is on the ground there now. Dana? Gotti, just as fired up as Vice President Kamala Harris was on that stage, so are the people here in Arizona who say this has gone way too far. As the Vice President said, this is one of the most restrictive states when it comes to abortions. No exceptions for rape or incest, only in the case that it saves the mother's life. And you have people here who are taking this fight now to November because there is a ballot initiative that is expected to go on the November ballot that could allow people to codify reproductive rights here in Arizona on the state constitution. And I got to tell you, Gotti, I've spoken to women who are angered, who are saddened, who say they want the politicians to stay out of their health care and their decisions for their own bodies. But even the doctors I've spoken to, they say that this has been very tough because People have been calling their offices, wanting to know what does this mean. I spoke to one doctor last night. He has a private practice. He's been doing this for nearly 30 years, and he was in tears because he said it's the women who are ultimately paying the price. Listen. We have the most vulnerable patients, and they're the ones who are going to pay the price. Um, the women who have five kids or four kids and are keeping a job or in abusive relationships, and I can go on and on and on because I see all of these people. I've seen them for 27 years. I serve the indigent population of Arizona. 75% of my patients are indigent or underprivileged or, or on state funding. That doctor is also fired up. He says that he hopes that they get this ballot initiative passed. He also told me that he is going to work this weekend because so many women have called 
to up their appointments because they're worried that this right to an abortion will be snatched over the next several weeks. And so he says he's going to be working through Sunday now to try to see those patients. Gotti? Dana, thanks so much. And don't go anywhere. We are just getting started. Up next, Mike Johnson's speakership could have been in danger. So he is bringing Donald Trump into the picture. The House Speaker and Trump met in Mar-a-Lago tonight. And Gabe Gutierrez will be here with all the details. Plus, some amazing artwork is uncovered in the ancient city of Pompeii. That and more headlines trending around the world are ahead. And later this hour... I went to camp. But this is a future of everything, so of course it was space camp. Check out how some of the greatest minds in the world are preparing the next generation of space explorers. And this is where space camp meets the 21st century, the Mars base. This is the kind of habitat that the future Artemis generation could find themselves living in. Welcome back. Two of the biggest power players in the Republican Party met at Mar-a-Lago. How the sit-down between Donald Trump and Mike Johnson went down. We're going to get to that in just a second. But first, here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. A judge has rejected a plea deal for a former American diplomat who apparently was a spy for Cuba. Manuel Rocha appeared in court today pleading guilty to defrauding the U.S. government. He admitted to working for Cuba as a secret agent for decades. Now, the judge rejected the initial plea deal, saying, it didn't have any restitution for any potential victims. Arrocha was sentenced to 15 years in prison. And an Alabama murderer is asking to be executed. The convicted killer on death row gave up all of his appeals, basically saying he doesn't want to delay justice for the families of the five people he murdered eight years ago. And lawsuits filed against Drake have been dismissed over that deadly Astro World concert. Families of 10 victims who died sued Drake, along with Travis Scott and Live Nation. But a judge dismissed Drake from that case on Wednesday. Drake was a special guest of Travis Scott during the 2021 festival. And President Biden is canceling even more student debt. Today, his administration announced more than $7 billion in student debt relief for 277,000 borrowers. The action is aimed at helping people on certain repayment plans. The White House has now canceled over $153 billion for 4.3 million Americans. And a new chlamydia vaccine is showing some promising results. Early stage trials proved to be safe and actually created an immune response. There's currently no shot to help protect against it. And chlamydia is actually the most common bacterial sexually transmitted infection in the United States. And now, could this recent curse of giving House speakers the boot be behind us? Well, former President Donald Trump has now put his support behind House Speaker Mike Johnson just days after far-right Congresswoman and Trump loyalist Marjorie Taylor Greene filed a motion to try to remove him. We're getting along very well with the Speaker, and I get along very well with Marjorie. Uh, I think he's doing a very good job. He's doing uh, about as good as you're going to do. And uh, I'm sure that Marjorie understands that. She's a very good friend of mine. And I know she has a lot of respect for the speaker. Those two men chatting today at Mar-a-Lago after Johnson traveled to Florida to meet with the former president, a move a lot of people saw as his way of securing his job. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has more. Yeah, Gotti, House Speaker Mike Johnson came here to Mar-a-Lago after a very busy morning where... House members voted to reauthorize uh, FISA, the uh, controversial uh, security bill that included that provision uh, that allowed officials to spy on foreign nationals. Uh, former President Trump has come up before and said he's not a fan of that, and that appeared to be a rift between him and House Speaker Mike Johnson. Of course, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene was threatening to oust Speaker Johnson over that and also his support for aid to Ukraine. But the House Speaker came here to Mar-a-Lago uh, seeking a political lifeline of sorts, and that's exactly what former President Trump gave him. He said he was doing a, a very good job and stood side by side uh, and said that uh, he and House Speaker Mike Johnson should move forward, basically trying to show unity uh, in the Republican Party. Now, the former president also made some news, Gotti, when I asked him um, whether he planned to testify in the upcoming trial. Jury selection is set to begin next week in New York. This is the trial where he's accused of false falsifying business records rela uh, related to alleged hush money payments to Stormy Daniels. I asked the former president whether he planned to testify. Here was his response. Uh, yeah, I would testify, absolutely. It's a scam. 
It's a scam. That's not a trail. That's not a trail. That's a scam. I'm testifying. I tell the truth. I mean, all I can do is tell the truth. And the truth is that there's no case. They have no case. And late today, Gotti, the judge in the New York hush money case actually denied a motion from former President Trump to delay the proceedings due to pretrial publicity. Jury selection is now set to begin on Monday. Gotti. Dave Gutierrez, thanks so much. And we're going to hear about that trial in just a bit, but some breaking news tonight to tell you about. A judge has ruled that he will not toss out Hunter Biden's federal gun case. Now, Biden was indicted last fall in federal court in Delaware on three counts connected to possession of a gun while using narcotics. A lawyer for Biden has not responded to a request for comment. Meanwhile, back to that trial that President Trump is saying he will not be testifying in in New York. That's that hush money case, and that trial is set to be Again on Monday, and it'll be the first time a former president will stand trial in a criminal case. NBC's Yasmin Vesuvian has a refresher on all you need to know about that case. The Trump hush money case is the first of four criminal cases to move to trial. Former President Donald Trump was charged with 34 counts of falsifying records in the first degree. But Trump is not the only one involved. Michael Cohen will likely be the star witness in the hush money case. He was Donald Trump's Thank lawyer you. and fixer. And on August 21st, 2018, he pled guilty to eight counts in Manhattan federal court. And Cohen alleged in a court of law, Donald Trump directed him to make illegal payments to influence the 2016 election, which Trump denies. I did it at the direction of and for the benefit of Donald J. Trump. Cohen was sentenced to three years in prison. Cohen alleges he orchestrated payoffs to two women who said they had affairs with Donald Trump including Stormy Daniels. He says he sought reimbursement from Trump and even recorded one of their conversations about it. The FBI sees that tape during a raid on Cohen's residence and office. Cohen's attorney released it to the media. Adult film actress Stormy Daniels, also known as Stephanie Clifford, says she met Donald Trump in 2006 at a celebrity golf tournament when he was the host of The Apprentice. Who loves The Apprentice? <laughs> Stormy says they had sex that night, and he offered to cast her in The Apprentice, which Trump denies. In 2011, the story leaked. Stormy says she gave an interview to a tabloid magazine for $15,000. It remained unpublished until 2018. But two years earlier, when Donald Trump was running for president, a tape from Access Hollywood... We're ready. Let's go. ...leaked, which prosecutors say caused panic within the Trump campaign. Two weeks later, Stormy Daniels was paid $130,000 by Trump's attorney, Michael Cohen. Karen McDougal is an ex-Playboy model and says she had an affair with Donald Trump. They allegedly met in 2006 at the Playboy Mansion, and she says they dated for nearly a year. Donald Trump denies they had a relationship. In 2016, when Donald Trump received the Republican nomination, McDougal's story leaked. AMI, the owner of the National Enquirer, offered her $150,000. They wanted to squash the story. Michael Cohen says he orchestrated the deal for AMI to buy McDougal's story, but never publish it to help Trump in the 2016 election. Allegations Trump denies. Alan Weisselberg was the Trump Organization's chief financial officer. He was mentioned several times in Michael Cohen's recording as being a part of the hush money plot. And I've spoken to Alan Weisselberg about how to set the whole thing up. In July of 2021, Alan Weisselberg and the Trump Corporation were indicted for scheming to defraud tax authorities at the federal, state and local level. He was sentenced to five months in prison and agreed to plead guilty and be a witness against the Trump Organization. They're looking to squeeze him again still to possibly get to Donald Trump. On March 4th, 2024, Alan Weisselberg pled guilty to perjury and lying under oath in the Trump civil fraud case, a deal that sends him back to prison but does not require him to testify in the hush money case. He's not been charged in that case. He's currently serving five months in prison. Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg and his team are the prosecutors in the trial. Bragg is a Harvard-educated Democrat and former assistant attorney general of New York. On December 6, 2022, D.A. Bragg secured the conviction of the Trump Corporation and the Payroll Corporation for conspiracy, criminal tax fraud, 
and falsifying business records. The focus in the last 24 hours has been almost exclusively on Trump. Then on March 30th, 2023, Donald Trump was indicted by DA Alvin Bragg in a Manhattan court. Days later, he was arraigned. Jasmine Vesuvian, thanks so very much. And coming up, we are going to head to some heavy rain that's about to pour down across parts of the country. We're going to have your forecast, but first, you got to see this. This is Grand Theft Auto, but with a little bit of a twist. The suspect was caught red-handed. No, nope, scratch that. That's bare-handed on video. That is a 500-pound black bear trying to break into a Florida State Trooper's cruiser. You can see it clawing there at the passenger door to try to get it open. The handle did break, but the bear gave up, and that's a good thing that that car door handle was not made for bear claws. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. And here are some of the stories happening out west that we're following right now. Shohei Otani's former interpreter, Ipe Mizuhara, made his first court appearance today. And he was released on bond and ordered not to contact the Dodgers superstar. Mizuhara also surrendered his passport and will have to get treatment for gambling addiction. He's being accused of stealing more than $16 million from Otani to cover gambling debts. And over to Colorado, where an abortion rights measure is expected to appear on the ballot in November. This comes after a reproductive Freedom Group collected almost enough signatures to qualify. They still need to collect a few more from registered voters in a couple of districts. And if the measure passes later this year, the proposed amendment would protect access to abortion in that state. And check out this video of a flaming school bus that crashed into a house. This happened earlier this week in Normandy, Missouri. The bus driver apparently got trapped inside but managed to jump off just in time. Luckily, no one else was on board and the family inside the house ran out of a side door moments before that bus hit. One person was treated at the scene and taken to the hospital. And heavy rain and flooding continues to impact millions from coast to coast. At least one city in Pennsylvania is under a state of emergency tonight due to yesterday's heavy rain and flash flooding. Pittsburgh saw nearly three inches of rain yesterday alone. And here on the West Coast, California is bracing for a wet weekend from a storm that is going to bring even more rain across the country next week. NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens joins us now with the forecast. Hey there, Bill. Well, good Friday to you, Gotti, and we are seeing two big storms. We have one that's been plaguing us all week long, and then we have a new one that's about to come on to the West Coast as we go throughout the evening. So the first storm, this is the one that caused the severe weather this week. We had flash flood emergencies in Tallahassee, New Orleans, uh, overnight just outside of Pittsburgh, and this storm is still cranking here. And around it, you can just see all the green and yellows. What a nasty day in the Ohio, especially around the Cleveland area to Pittsburgh. Detroit's been kind of ugly, cold rainy and we've had showers and thunderstorms rolling through the northeast and this is going to continue overnight tonight and then a little bit into your Saturday. So we pause this at noon Saturday and it's cold enough in the Adirondacks and the Catskills and central New York that you will see snowflakes out of this and the, we'll, the, as the storm exits out it'll be some gusty winds with it too. So by the time we get to Saturday evening a little bit in the areas of the Green Mountains of Vermont we'll see a little bit of snow northern Adirondacks. Not a lot will accumulate but just the fact you're still seeing snow uh, disheartening for some. And then a blast of rain and thunderstorms rolls through late Sunday afternoon and evening. So heads up everyone here in central New York, Pennsylvania, New York City, Hartford, up towards Boston. Not going to be severe, but it's going to be a pretty nice uh, Sunday. And then all of a sudden these storms will come through late in the day. So here's how your weekend forecast is going to play out. Middle of the country is great. Where we had all that rain and the severe weather earlier this week, you are looking fantastic. 80s and 90s widespread through the middle of the country. Nice in the southeast. Great for the masters after a windy day today. Today. Then on Sunday, we mentioned those storms. And I haven't mentioned much about the West because we're going to talk about that now. This is the new storm system that's moving in. A little late in the rain season for a storm like this. We are going to see snow in the highest of elevations. Nothing crazy. This isn't like a huge, powerful storm. Just the timing of it on the weekend's not great. Showers around San Francisco. We will see some rain moving into LA. It looks like late as we go throughout your afternoon on Saturday. Then even on Sunday, it kind of lingers with some showers on and off. Not going to rain all day long, but we will see the mountain passes cold enough 
Roosevelt that we will have some problems with some snow. So as far as the issues will go, rainfall, it does not look like we're going to see significant flooding, maybe some isolated in some of the mountainous areas. The mountains north of here are Santa Barbara, locally up to three inches, same just south of Monterey. We will see about one inch where it rains, not the snow, obviously, in areas of the central portions of California and the Sierra. And then when this storm heads into the middle of the country, this is the real headline with this storm. Yes, it ruins some people's weekend in California, but by the time we get to Monday, this storm is going to pose a severe weather risk. We could actually see a severe weather outbreak. We're very concerned here. Wichita Falls, Oklahoma City to Wichita, and then the storm system will head through the Midwest as we go through Tuesday. So, God, we will talk more about that next week. Looking forward to it. Bill Cairns, thanks so much. Now, you'd think that police officers and violent gangs would be sworn enemies, but what if in some cases the cops are gang members themselves? In Los Angeles County, those are some of the allegations the sheriff's department continues to face, and NBC's Priya Shrether has more. There's a different kind of gang problem in Los Angeles County. The people meant to serve and protect a population of more than 9 million people, allegedly part of powerful gangs going back decades, according to watchdog groups and the alleged victims of their crimes. Groups of LA sheriff deputies with threatening names like the Banditos, the Cavemen, the Executioners. The deputies rep their cliques, tattooing their bodies with logos and throwing up gangs signs. The gangs facing allegations they use violent excessive force against Angelinos. To me they're punks. The people that killed my sons that executed my sons. And intimidate fellow deputies who don't play along. The terrorizing behavior costing the LA County taxpayers a fortune. The inspector general's office counts $54 million in settlements involving deputy gang activity. The first obstacle to arrest Eradicating them, though, many past sheriffs dispute their very existence. Well, you're still trying to pretend the deputy gang exists and work in the countryside of Philippines. The investigation continues. But the current sheriff, Robert Luna, who took office in late 2022, went public with his efforts to combat the problem. We must eliminate deputy gangs. A city and state approved civilian oversight commission released a 70 page report last year on how the sheriff's office should crack down on them. The commission's special counsel telling us they turned over a list of more than 20 recommendations. But so far, members of that oversight board, as well as attorneys for the victims, say Sheriff Luna hasn't put a stop to the gangs like he promised. It's a lot bigger than one sheriff. It's sheriff after sheriff, administration after administration. In a statement to NBC News, the L.A. Sheriff's Office say they've drafted a new law enforcement gang, clique, and subgroups policy, but that it's still under negotiation with the powerful deputies union. We don't get it! Turn it down. We were trying to publicize the existence of the deputy gangs and put, put the community in power over the gangs and over the sheriff's department itself. In the meantime, a growing chorus in L.A. who say it's time to stop waiting for the county or the sheriff to clean things up. If this uh, gang problem isn't promptly solved, that the next logical step will be federal litigation, the appointment of a monitor, and oversight by a federal judge. Other police departments who struggled with different issues like excessive force and police bias in cities like Detroit, Seattle, and Pittsburgh all saw what officials say were significant improvements under federal oversight. But the Department of Justice so far hasn't moved in that direction. NBC News reached out to the DOJ for comment but haven't heard back. If these alleged gangs are dealt with, it won't be soon enough for people like Sergeant Rosa Gonzalez who claimed she was retaliated against for speaking out against the East L.A. banditos. Gonzalez declined an on-camera interview with NBC News, saying doing so would mean facing further consequences, proving the stronghold these supposed gangs still have over one of the largest populations in the country. Priya Shreether, Shreether NBC News. Priya, thanks so much. Still to come, after nearly 2,000 years, Roman paintings were just discovered in Pompeii. It is one of the most dramatic findings under all that volcanic ash in years. Those details and other stories trending around the world are coming up next, so stay tuned.
Hey there, welcome back. Time for a quick look at headlines trending around the world. In Ukraine, troops are struggling as Russia steps up its attacks, all while Ukrainians are seeing more delays when it comes to aid. A $61 billion aid package is still stuck in the House after its Senate approval in February. Without the help, Ukraine's defense is both outgunned and outmanned, and soldiers are trying to keep their ground against Russia, but supplies are quickly running out, and leaders are worried that if the U.S. doesn't pitch in soon, Ukraine could lose the war. And lawmakers in Germany just approved a law making it easier for people to legally change their name and their gender on official documents. Now, it's part of a government effort to make life easier for transgender, intersex, and non-binary people. And the new rule gets rid of the barriers in the process, allowing people to change their name and their gender and registry offices. Now, the current law makes people wait for a court decision to change their name. An Italian fashion designer, Roberto Cavalli, died today at 83. His fashion company he shared that news on Instagram, and he is known for his use of animal prints and stars like Beyonce and Jennifer Lopez have worn his designs over the years. An archaeologist in Pompeii, Italy, discovered ancient paintings in the latest excavation of the city's ruins. They found the paintings in debris from a volcanic eruption that destroyed the site thousands of years ago. And the art is on the walls of what used to be a big banquet hall there and shows Greek figures like Helen of Troy and Apollo. Incredible. Meanwhile, the U.S. State Department is stopping some of its workers from traveling to large parts of Israel after Iran has promised revenge on the country for a deadly attack on their embassy in Syria that Iran says Israel carried out. Israel saying if they are attacked, they, quote, know how to respond. NBC News international correspondent Hala Garani has more. Tonight, the Pentagon repositioning assets, including fighter jets and ships in the Mideast, in preparation for a potential Iranian attack against Israel. As President Biden is warning, a strike could happen soon. I got expectations sooner than later. President, what is your message to Iran in this moment? Don't. A U.S. intelligence assessment warns an Iranian attack could include a swarm of drones or land attack cruise missiles hitting Israeli diplomatic or consular facilities to U.S. officials, tell NBC News. All of it almost two weeks after Iran vowed to retaliate for a bombing on its embassy compound in Syria that it blames on Israel, where several top Iranian military officials were killed. Iran is a top backer of Hamas and Hezbollah, and Iran's supreme leader has warned Israel, quote, will be punished. President Biden vowing support if a strike happens. We will defend, help defend Israel, and Iran will not succeed. The question now as the region braces for a possible retaliatory attack by Iran is when and how Tehran will choose to act. Hala Garani, thanks so very much. Now, after hearing this news of a potential escalation, you might be wondering, why is Iran at the center of all this drama in the Middle East? NBC News international correspondent Keir Simmons is here to tell us. Hamas carrying out the October 7th attack, the deadliest day in Israel's history, spurring the war in Gaza. <laughs> Houthi rebels striking and hijacking ships in the Red Sea. <laughs> and Hezbollah firing rockets back and forth with Israel on its border with Lebanon. All of them Iranian-backed militant groups, some closer than others, but often trained and armed by the Iranian government. And now, some key questions. About who these militants are, what their mission is, and why Iran backs so many of them, and where the money really comes from. It all goes back to the 1979 Iranian Revolution. Since then, the Islamic Revolutionary Government has had a clear goal, according to experts, to weaken and even eliminate American influence in the Middle East. Iran has two main goals by supporting these militant groups and in some cases creating these proxies across the region. The first one is that part of their foreign policy is to pursue instability and spread instability across the Middle East. And that is because it helps them achieve their broader goal, which is ultimately to spread Iranian influence across the region. Iran is also a vocal supporter of the Palestinian cause and clear enemies with US ally Israel. Iran is surrounded by U.S. troops at bases and facilities in Iraq, the Persian Gulf and Syria. 
But ironically, it was the 2003 US invasion of Iraq that strengthened the Iranian government by removing a regional opponent, dictator Saddam Hussein. America's military footprint much smaller now, and Iran uses proxy groups to flex its strength and avoid blame. These militant groups, calling themselves the Islamic resistance, say they're acting now in opposition to the United States' support for Israel in the war in Gaza. And Iran, likely using some of the billions it's bringing in from oil exports, now at a five-year high, to fund these militias. Sometimes they send cash to these groups across the region. That is not difficult for them to do. And bolstering its strength more, even in the face of tough U.S. sanctions, its deepening partnership with Russia and China, also at odds with the United States. The spotlight now again on what amounts to a shadow war between the U.S. and Iran, an endless source, many say, of the tension in the region. Keir Simmons, NBC News. Keir, thanks for that. Now, in restaurants all over the world, a Michelin star is considered to be the top honor, the creme de la creme, but only 6% of recipients have been led by women, and even less than that have been black women. Well, enter Adejoke Bakari, a great chef in the UK, and a history-making one at that. NBC News correspondent Megan Fitzgerald has her story from London. In the heart of central London, just off the famous Oxford Street, is a very unassuming gem with a chef that's serving up more than just cuisine. She's serving her story. We are using what we have, which is the immigrant story, I feel, most of the time, where wherever you are, what you find there, you incorporate into your food. But she's also making history. Adejoke Bakari, owner of Shishiru, meaning the silence that descends on the table when food arrives, is the UK's first ever black female Michelin star chef and only the second in the world. An honor she received just six months after opening. I'm trying to show that West African food has the same uh, value, has got the same kind of complexity and can stand on the world stage the same as other recognized cuisines. This is where we come from, this is how we eat. And it might not be like other people, but this is us. An authenticity that's putting West African food on the map, drawing in people from all different backgrounds. What's amazing about Yoko is that she's self-trained um, and she maintains the soul of this food, but is really able to elevate the ways in which she cooks it, the way she presents it. A self-trained chef who grew up cooking for her family in Nigeria, but got her start at a pop-up restaurant in South London. I know that you went to school for something I know nothing about. Was it microbiology or something complicated? And then now you're a chef. You didn't go to France and get the fine culinary. So how did you get here? Six weeks or so into our opening, a very renowned food critic came in, and he writes about it, and it just, it just blew up. It just blew up. From the very beginning, Bakari has been determined to stay true to her African roots, never altering or changing her food, and native West Africans can tell. There are a lot of hidden gems um, in our culture, so it's great to see her being received in that way and flying the flag of West Africa. We put a very high bar about anybody cooking our food. Yes. And yes, and we're not shy about expressing our opinion. Exactly. <laughs> A pride and a message to the world that being exactly who you are is enough. The young people cooking the same kind of way I'm cooking can say there is value to our food. They can see it and can show pride in it as well. That's what Michelin has done for our food here at Chishu. Megan Fitzgerald, NBC News, London. What a delicious assignment, Megan. Thanks so much for that. Before we go, we are taking you to space camp. Aside from me actually getting into a real rocket, this is pretty much the next best thing. We're going to show you all that after the break. So, stay tuned. All right, we're in Huntsville, Alabama. And, oh, uh, yeah, we got the sunroof open because that is a Saturn V rocket. It's one of the first things that you see. Space camp, here we come.
Hey there, welcome back. Lawmakers are still trying to ban TikTok here in the United States, but that is not stopping the company from experimenting with some new features over in Europe. CNBC senior media and tech correspondent Julia Borstein explains. TikTok is far bigger than it was when it last faced a potential ban, but now, after Senator Mitch McConnell called for action towards banning the app, it's facing a newer challenge of keeping up its growth. Thursday, TikTok had a big win. Taylor Swift's songs returned to the platform after a 10-week hiatus, this ahead of the release of her coming studio album. But TikTok and Universal Music Group, the world's largest music label, continue to be in a standoff. The label pulled its songs from the platform and accused TikTok of trying to bully it into accepting a deal worth less than its prior contract. It also comes as TikTok rolls out a new app called TikTok Lite in Europe. It gives users rewards, which they can redeem for gift cards and tips to give creators for engaging on the platform or inviting friends to sign up. This in an effort to engage new users. It's also in the early stages of experimentation with a new app called Notes that's for sharing photos and captions or notes about them, which is similar to Instagram, though the company says there are no plans yet to make this app broadly available. This experimentation with formats similar to Instagram or even YouTube comes as time on TikTok flatlined in the past year compared to Instagram's 10% growth and engagement. This is quite a change from the days when those platforms, including Instagram, copied TikTok's short form video format. Julia Borston, CNBC Business News, Los Angeles. Julia, thank you. Now, when it comes to the future of space, the next wave of missions will depend on a whole new generation of explorers. And these young minds are fueled by curiosity and the burning desire to get back to the moon, to get to Mars and beyond even that. But what does it take to become an astronaut? Well, there's only one way to find out. Tonight, we are going inside space camp where cadets of all ages are put to the test with simulations, experiments, and even a little taste of Martian living. We have made it start. Four, three, two, one, zero. Booster ignition. Ooh, it's quite loud, isn't it? And liftoff, special discovery. At Space Camp, it's never too late for liftoff. <laughs> all right. All my childhood dreams are coming true right now. <laughs> First, buckle up, because my crash course in becoming an astronaut starts with a spin. And it's called the multi-axis trainer. Yes. Because I'm going to be spinning on all the axes. All the axes. There we go. Oh, yeah. All right, Johnny, how you feeling? I feel great. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's like the most complicated rocking chair I've ever been in. <laughs> Scuba diving for space is completely different than ocean scuba diving. This is more like a lunar walk. Correct. Where we're just jumping around with our feet vertical than it is like scuba diving on Earth. I see a basketball hoop down there. Yeah, you're going to shoot some hoops. Am I going to school these kids right here? What do you think? Clearly a skill that could come in handy on the courts of a lunar star base. Mars, it's a whole other ball game. And this is where Space Camp meets the 21st century, the Mars base. It gets a little tight in here. Come on in, come check this out. <laughs> Future astronauts training not just for what's to come, but honoring the history that allowed us to leave our planet and explore, like those famous Apollo missions to the moon and the legendary Saturn V rocket. <laughs> when you're underneath this thing, it finally sinks in. How insane it is that we humans put astronauts on the tippity top of this thing. This is the size of the Statue of Liberty. Saturn V rocket is one of the crowning achievements of humankind, and it's something that's changed space travel forever. And so here we go. This is the largest artifact of the Smithsonian Institution. This is what took us to the moon. That's right. It was a period of stepped up activity in anticipation of the first manned flight in Apollo. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. How is the quality of the TV? Oh, it's beautiful, Mike, it really is. 
And while the days of Apollo and the shuttles are behind us, Space Camp is all about preparing a whole new generation with a Look. new mission and a new name. What we call now the Artemis generation. Mm -hmm. These are people that are growing up with the expectation that, of course, we're going back to the moon and we're going on to Mars. Your lives started not too long ago. What do you think you're going to see in your lifetime? Hopefully, something happening with Mars, First I reckon. Mars. Yeah. yeah, I reckon something with that will happen. Meet Ruby, Hannah, and Lily. All the way from Australia, these Generation Artemis campers are obsessed with all things cosmos. Do you see yourselves in space in the future? Well, maybe not in space. I mean, I yeah. could go to space. That would she be pretty fun. She could go to space. So you're, in, you're maybe doing support down here? And every job matters because while the space industry is booming, studies show a shrinking pool of young engineers entering the field. At NASA, only 17% of the agency's workforce are millennials or Gen Z, and the Artemis generation aims to change that. Well, check this out. Hey, Lily. Hello. You, you made Commander? Oh, yeah. Commander, huh? Yeah. Okay, don't crash. We'll, we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> and with commanders like Lily taking the helm, anything is possible. And without curiosity, we'd have nothing. And the willingness to always want to know more, like not just stopping at what is already in front of you. You guys give me hope for the future. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hope for the future, and hopefully they'll let me stow away. And finally, tonight in our 60 Seconds of Joy, a school program in Pennsylvania is helping kids build confidence in reading with the help of a group of cuddly little lambs. NBC News correspondent Rahima Ellis has that story. When four little lambs go to school each spring, Miss Tosi's third grade class is a favorite place to visit. They cuddle up and listen to kids like nine-year-old Gracie Juarez read out loud. I felt like a sneeze coming on while I hopped and I snuck. The best thing about reading to the lambs is that they never judge of how good you read. What do they do? They just listen. There actually is research that suggests that when children have the opportunity to read to animals, it can actually help develop their, their reading abilities. She says the lambs are just one of a variety of tools the district uses to help children feel more comfortable and develop a joy of reading. Even when a lamb takes a bite out of the book, the kids take it in stride and just keep reading. It's hard to catch a bunny. With lambs by their side, every page the kids read Mace had to do something. is a story of success. Rahima Ellis, NBC News, Cole Center, Pennsylvania. <laughs> it's so cute. That does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you here Monday, but until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.